So I wanted to talk about kind of an old-fashioned topic tonight, uh, heaven. And heaven may sound sort of unsophisticated and uh, something we don't really concern ourselves with that much um, in our modern, postmodern era, but it still is a word that uh, still is a concept that has meaning to me. Uh, when I started out as a young minister being trained in a liberal theological seminary, we were a little disdainful about heaven. Um, we were trained in my theological uh, uh, tradition to focus more on things of earth, this life, and I still believe that, that the purpose of religion is not just to train us for the life to come, but it is important for us to focus our efforts spiritually and materially on this world, this life. Uh, I know that religion can be misused and often has been misused to try to distract people uh, and to resign them to their material circumstances here and now uh, by, uh, by distracting them and saying, oh, things will all be better in heaven and that people have been exploited by religion uh, in order to uh, prevent them from really focusing on changing the circumstances of this world. But uh, I don't think that's the point of heaven. I do believe that there is a life after this life. That w life does not end with our material death. And I didn't always have a strongly evolved sense of that. But I have come to believe it uh, because of uh, not only what I've read and what I've read in the Bible and what I've learned in seminary, uh, but because of what I have learned as a pastor and in my own circumstance as well, being present at the death of many people is a great privilege and uh, it's a profound spiritual experience that never, ever, ever becomes routine to me. Uh, because I have been privileged to be a witness to that, I will attest to this. Death is not the final thing. It is a change. Something happens. Sometimes it's painful, sometimes it's not pretty, sometimes it is beautiful. It is always something powerful. And heaven is our perhaps inadequate word to describe what happens next. Now we use the word heaven uh, rather loosely, I think, to describe a wide range of things. Heaven can be used to uh, describe, uh, you know, the indescribable. Um, sometimes we use it to say, um, we see a beautiful place and say that's heavenly. If you've been to Provincetown, out at the very end of the tip uh, in Provincetown, the outermost part, uh, where the lighthouse is at sunset, who can deny that heaven is a perfect word for that? And there are probably other places that you've been. If you've been to Texas in the middle of summer, as I was two weeks ago, who could deny that there is the other place that is not heaven? Uh, because I think there, there's a reality to that as well. I was just there two weeks ago and I thought, oh no, this is not heaven. Uh, there is another word for this, and that's what it is. Uh, it can be a physical place, it can be a spiritual place. Um, our, uh, sometimes we ascribe God as living up in heaven, in the celestial places, and we on earth or below, beneath the earth. I don't know that it has to have a spatial meaning or geographical meaning, but for our purposes, I want to say this. Heaven is what we aspire to. It's a word that associates with what we dream toward. I don't, I want to dislink it, unlink it from the notion of it as reward somehow, but I do want to maintain it as an idea of what we aspire toward. Uh, part of the continuum of life and death. And heaven is part of the here and the hereafter. Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven and he talked about the kingdom of God. I don't want to use a sexist or patriarchal word like kingdom. It's dated. Um, we could say this, the reign of God, the presence of God, the community of God, or the community of heaven. Um, in Luke's gospel, Jesus uses the phrase kingdom of God because he's talking to a non-Jewish group largely. And 
they were not uncomfortable using the name of God. So they, when Jesus was talking about his vision of community, he would use this phrase, kingdom of God, or reign of God, or realm of God. When uh, he was speaking to his own people, his own religion, Jesus the Jew, because there was a reluctance to say the name of God, he used this rather more pious phrase, heaven, interchangeably, kingdom of heaven. He didn't have this strong association with the afterlife because Judaism didn't believe in the life to come in a strong and evolved way, in the way that we Christians have come to associate it. Here and hereafter, we're a continuum. Or let's say the emphasis was on the here. Uh, let's put it that way. So when Jesus talks about kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven, it was about the life that we have. And that may include the life that is to come. It's a false dichotomy to say here, hereafter. But what happens next? What we aspire to, including what happens after we die, I think is part of that for us in our spiritual lives. So I do want to address the notion of this spectrum of life and what happens next and what we aspire to and what it means for our spiritual lives, including what happens in the afterlife, the kingdom of heaven, that old-fashioned word. And I want to do it because I think it has meaning for our lives. Also because, I don't know about you, but I really need to think about, I've been needing to hear some comforting words about heaven, personally too. I need to be assured that there is meaning to this, all of this, including what happens after we die. I have I've felt that strong need, and I don't think I'm alone in this right now. I have been paying attention here at MCC Boston to our prayers over the last month. I know about the needs in my own life, uh, to the church I serve in Needham as well, to friends in other places. And I think every now and then, particularly for those of us who are Christian, we need to be reminded there is a life after this life, that there is resurrection and life. And though it may sound old fashioned, I just want to say it. We live beyond this life. And we will be together again with the people that we love but no longer see. And we don't often take the time to say it, but I wanted to say it. Mark, I want to say that you're going to see your mother again. I hope that's comforting to you. I really believe that. You will see your mother again. I want to say to Melissa, I'm so sorry about your loss. You will see your friend again. And that's not just pious words. I know it. I mentioned in prayer a few weeks ago, the day after it happened, that my friend Lee Covington, who had been my secretary in, when I worked at the church in Dallas, you know, there's no language for this, right? What's the language for my friend Lee Covington had been murdered, right? Brutally. What is the language that we have for the person that you work 10 feet away from? He, because he was my executive assistant, 10 hours a day sometimes, six days a week, that you know everything about, and he knows everything about you. You don't socialize outside of work very much, but because of the demands of your jobs, that's how close you are. And the nature of your work is very intimate right and that goes on for a long time and when you hear about their death a brutal death it hurts because they were part of you and you were part of them we don't even have a word for that kind of relationship right but i know that you have worked with people some of you here and we don't even ever talk about that intimacy that is part of that when you know everything about each other you know, we would ask each other if we paid our bills uh, or things like that, you know, like, um, and other things that were very private that we knew. I was going through a divorce at the time. He knew things about me because we worked that close. We read each other's email. We took each other's phone calls. I need to hear that I will see him again in heaven and that the terrible suffering that I knew he went through in his last moments we're not the end of his life. I mean, do you hear the words that Jesus brings around comfort? Do you know what I mean? Uh, it's not enough to just let it hang in the air. 
the words that we as Christians, not just the words, the certainty that we have that suffering is not the end, are important to state somehow. I know there are others who need to hear these words of comfort about heaven, about what's next, that there's vindication collectively, are important to say out loud right now for our community too. This is a kind of a brutal week to be gay in, don't you think, to be queer in. Um, you know, there's a reason there's that MCC church still. I know we're small here in Boston, and I know that there are other churches. I'm glad to be a member of the United Church of Christ too, where this morning I could get up and read the statement from our UCC denomination that said, discrimination in any form violates our values as followers of Jesus Christ and as Americans who believe in liberty and justice for all, transgender citizens in uniform have proven time and again their dedication to this country. They deserve our support and respect. But here's what I want to say about an MCC church. I could put on Facebook this week, we are a church of the transgender community. We, not they, we. That's the difference. And also our friends and allies. But that's the difference between, I mean, we need both. But this is why I know we're not done in MCC. Do you believe that too? Can we say this? Transgender is we, not they. This is what I felt during the AIDS years. The straight churches would say, we take care of them. Our AIDS ministry is to them. But in MCC, we used to say, we minister to each other. And we didn't worry if people had to then explain, well, I'm not personally, you know, this or that. You know, we, we could explain that later. But our primary identification in the face of discrimination was always a we. And this week, we are proud to say in MCC, in the face of transgender discrimination, we are a we first, right? That's what heaven looks like. When you don't have to worry whether people will stand with you or not. Heaven already happens on earth when we say we, and you don't have to worry that you're going to be picked off or whether or not someone will have your back because we stand together. Later, we can work out, you know, whether a person is actually transgender or not. We are transgender at MCC. We're other things too. But we can say that, right? This week, See, Mark did, I wouldn't say you stole the thunder, I'll say you laid the groundwork for my sermon. But you know me well enough to know that if you're going to have Jim Matulski preach, he's going to come with his New York Times clippings <laughs> about the transgender and, and, the, uh, and the president. I'm not even going to say it. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, and about the Justice Department and our Attorney General, who is undoing all that the previous administration had worked to do to provide protection and make a connection between discrimination on the basis of race and gender and now unhinge that, unhinge gay protection from that. That's what he did this week and he's pledging to use the resources of the Justice Department that we should be hearing sirens, right? These sirens should be drawing our attention to this. The LGBT community is uh, vulnerable. And this was not an anomaly. He was laying down a gauntlet to say, this is what our government's resources are going to try to do now. We are not safe. And we need other people to be saying we with us on this. Heaven looks like other people standing with us not our having to say it first and say it alone. Last Sunday, 10 people perished in a refrigerator truck in San Antonio. Migrants exercising the human civil right of migration.
coming from Central America to the United States. They died in a truck of heat and dehydration in the back of a truck. That was hell. That was not heaven. And I don't hear a lot of people talking about it this week. They reported it. Heaven is when we rise up as a group and say, oh no, no more deaths like that. You know, we know what that's like. How many years? This is what Angels in America was about. Silent deaths. Years of silent deaths where nobody stood up and said anything unless they were affected by it directly. That's what's happening right now with immigration. People are dying in trucks trying to find a better life. The sirens are perfect soundtrack to what I'm trying to say. We need to be paying attention. Hell is when nobody pays attention. The kingdom of heaven is when we stand together and do something about it. I was so excited when I heard that the Angels in America broadcast was taking place. I thought, oh my God, it's going to be really hard to get a ticket, right? I know that I have these crazy ideas that the whole world is excited about, the weird cultural things that I'm excited about. So there were eight people in the theater in Dedham uh, uh, for this. And it recounted in Angels in America these, this era of the 80s and 90s when we had a terribly repressive government and um, there were people who were living prosperous lives who were not interested in the deaths of large numbers of gay people and others from AIDS. Roy Cohn was a notorious American lawyer. Who knows who Roy Cohn was? It's okay if you didn't. It just, it's, it's always instructive to me. It's okay. Um, he, um, so he was very evil. That's all I'll say. Um, he defend, he, I can't even tell you shortly who he was. He was a very evil person. And history has judged him to be so. But he was, he uh, died of AIDS, but he was very anti-gay. And he delivered this line, it's played by Al Pacino, I think, in the film version, um, where he says, America, it's a terrible place to be a sick person. It was not meant to be a comic line, but this Thursday night, you remember all the health care hearings, right? But all eight of us in the theater were convulsed with laughter at this. Because it, you know, we come from, we all left our homes to go to this uh, broadcast and to hear this line that was not meant to be funny. But it was funny because here we were in 2017 hearing a person say, America is a terrible place to be a sick person. The only really good thing you could say about this, about what happened this week, well, some good things, but was that across party lines, people agreed they were unwilling to let 16 million people be hung out to dry with no health insurance, right? People's health mattered somehow, in some weird way. This is important. Some value emerged. In Tony Kushner's version of what heaven looked like in Angels in America, or the kingdom of God, in other ways, in Luke's Gospel, other examples, the here, the hereafter, this life, the life to come, the life that we have, the only life we have. He gives a bunch of rapid-fire examples. In 33, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed sowed in the field. It's the smallest thing. And then it becomes the biggest plant in first century Palestine, they said it could be on horseback and still be, it would be larger than you. So eight feet, that's pretty big, from the tiniest little thing. 
He said, look, the littlest thing can become the biggest thing. Don't disregard the impact that you can have. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. So they didn't even like yeast. Yeast was kind of a pesty thing. They did a lot to try and keep it away in some instances. So he's already toying with a, a metaphor that not everyone was entirely comfortable with, right? And a little bit of something can have a profound effect. He uses two examples from everyday life, not something abstract and remote. Jesus was all about your real life, the way you really live it. Look for ways that God can, through you, make a profound effect or impact. A small thing can become a large thing. God can do a lot with a little in cooperation with human beings using the resources that they have, however small. Despise not the small thing. And then skipping down, several more examples in rapid fire succession. Maybe Jesus didn't really say them this way, but just picture him trying to convince a group of people who'd had a really terrible week, who were in need of comfort in their personal lives and for whatever was happening in, in their community or in society, saying, all right, look, try this. All right, try that. Or try this. One of these is gonna land and I'm gonna keep trying them until one of them lands. The kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field which some, somebody found and hid. And then the joy that comes when they saw, sell all that they have and buy that field. There's something about the joy when we're doing the thing that leads to the change. The joy is an important component. It's worth focusing and deploying everything you have to make this thing happen. This spoke to me about this church. I want to say this about MCC Boston. We're all busy people. Who's got time for this? And yet we show up here because we think there's something important right. that needs to happen here. I know, you know, I've been coming here a year now. None of us have time for this. And you know why I do it? I'll tell you why. Because I believe in it. And you know what? Two weeks ago, three weeks ago, when I needed a place to come and cry, a gay place to come and cry, a queer place to come and cry, is that a friend of mine died that I could even explain it to straight people what happened. I knew I could come here and without judgment just be here. And I can't even explain that to straight people now, and I love straight people, and this isn't about that. But I knew I could come here on Sunday night, and there might be four people here on a hot, hot July night. And that's just one little example. It is worth the time we put in here and the times we drag ourselves here on Sunday nights and we don't even have time to do it. And the extra money we put in our tithes to make this, keep this place open. This is that field, the treasure that's buried here. Again, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. I'm finding one pearl of great value. She went and sold all that she had and bought it. Now, if a string of pearls can't speak to a group like this, I don't know, I don't know what will. Jesus had this, had us in mind. I love this one. The pearl merchant knew pearls, okay? This wasn't like a random discovery. A person who actually understood the value of pearls found an even greater pearl and knew that it was worth spending all for it. When we find what matters, it's worth giving ourselves to it, whatever it is, even if other people don't understand it. This is the kind of Jesus spirituality I want to lift up for us tonight in our lives, even if we can't explain it to others. When you find the thing, the person, the people, the cause, the time, the moment, that evokes from you something that you have never given to that extent before,
Don't withhold. Give it. Give it. This is heaven. You're making heaven happen. And I don't mean make a fool of yourself or overspend or, but I do mean this. Don't deny your passion. It's an opportunity to do something you won't regret later. This is what Jesus is inviting you to think about. All these images, Jesus says, wait, let me try one more. I can tell, I'm close, but you're not quite getting it. A, a net that gathers all these fish, every kind of fish imaginable. Try that on, does that work? All these inclusive, large images trying to stimulate their imagination. Dream big, Jesus was saying. And then here's my favorite line in the whole passage. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? He says to them. And they go, yes. Nonsense. I don't think they understood him at all. It's okay to say to Jesus, it's okay to say to people with authority, it's okay to say to the preacher. No. <laughs> sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. I think Jesus was make, doing his earnest level best to try to communicate something important, and I'm not sure that they fully understood what he was saying. Never say yes if you don't believe it, to please somebody else. But he did make one more effort. He said, look, it's like this. If you're the master of the household and you bring out your treasure, what is new and what is old, this was his best advice about heaven. Bring it all out. The new, the old. Everything. Bring it out. Try it out. Don't hold back. Experiment. Something new, something old. Don't hold back. Jesus' intent was to bring comfort about what is here and what is next. And that's my intent tonight. I want to comfort us and inspire us about what's happening now and what's happening next, about this life and about the life to come. And I want to say that about our church. I want to assure us about what's unfolding in society. And I want to say this in very clear terms for anyone who needs to hear it. We will be together again in the life to come. That love is stronger than death that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, and we will live eternally in his presence. Amen.